hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jenny Eastwood and I post a true crime deep dive video every couple of weeks about a case from somewhere in the world. So if you're interested in true crime and you enjoy these deep dive videos then I highly suggest you hit that subscribe button because you will not be disappointed. Now, before we go ahead and get into today's case, I do just want to give a quick disclaimer. Today's case deals with the issue of grooming and sexual assault. Uh, so if that is something that you might be sensitive to, then I recommend that you click out of this video and I'll hopefully see you around in the future with a video that is a bit more suited to you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into today's story. So I just finished reading the book Lolita by Vladimir Nomokov and I have been meaning to read it for a while. It's known as a classic and when you think of Lolita, if you haven't read the book, you probably think of a girl with um, heart-shaped glasses looking into a rear view mirror with a lollipop in her mouth. So that was kind of what I was expecting when I went into it. But as I read it, I was really shocked. It was not at all what I was expecting and it was actually thoroughly disturbing and very hard to get through. If you don't know, I'll give you a brief synopsis of the story of Lolita. It's about a 40-something man who is a French literature professor called Humbert Humbert and he develops a erotic obsession with a 12-year-old girl called Dolores Hayes who he affectionately names Lolita or Lo. He manipulates his way into her life by marrying her mother and when her mother dies he becomes her sole carer but because he has nefarious intentions he takes her, skips town and they go on a years-long road trip around America hoping to evade law enforcement and avoid drawing unwanted attention. But as I was reading it, I started to wonder if this was based on a true story or was there any inspiration for this? So I started Googling and to my shock and horror, um, it actually is inspired by the story, the kidnapping of 11 year old Sally Horner in 1948. So I started digging and looking into this case and an author named Sarah Weinman has done the same. And she has written a book called The Real Lolita all about Sally Horner's story. So today we are talking about the case of Sally Horner and her 21 month long kidnapping. Florence Sally Horner was born on April 18th, 1937 in Camden, New Jersey, which is just across the bridge from Philadelphia. Sally grew up in a poor working class household. She had one older sister called Susan who had just gotten married and recently found out that she was pregnant. She worked in a greenhouse with her husband Al Panero. Sally's mother, Ella Horner, was a widow and she was struggling to come to terms with the recent death of Sally's father. He was an alcoholic who had killed himself five years prior and she found it really difficult to maintain any work. She primarily worked as a seamstress but she was often in between jobs. At the time, Camden was a working class town. It had robust manufacturing, but at the time that these events occurred, it was at the start of the decline, which was just beginning to set in and would actually become a permanent state of being for the town. So between Sally's mother working pretty much round the clock to keep the family afloat and her older sister having moved on to start a family of her own, Sally was pretty lonely. She attended Northeast School in Camden and although she was just days away from finishing fifth grade, when an opportunity came up for her to join the ranks of this popular cool girls club at school, she jumped at the chance. Sally wasn't that popular at school and if she managed to make her way into this cool girls club, then it would basically be like a ticket to popularity. But there was a catch. One could not simply join this girls group, you had to first pass a test. And in Sally's case, her initiation involved going into a Woolworths on Broadway and Federal and stealing a five cent notebook. Now, Sally had never stolen anything in her life and the thought of breaking the law made her feel sick to her stomach. And prior to this, the only reason she ever normally went into that store was to get stationery or to buy her favorite candy. But nevertheless, on the afternoon of June 13th, 1948, Sally entered the store and she had no idea that the simple act of shoplifting would change her life forever. So she walked into the Woolworths and made a beeline for the first notebook that she saw. It was sitting on a bright white nickel countertop. She grabbed it and stuffed it in her bag and quickly made her way hurrying to the exit. 
She kept her eyes straight, focusing on the path ahead, and she thought she'd pretty much made it home and hosed and was just about free when she felt a hand tug on her arm. When she looked up, she met the gaze of a tall, thin man with sharp features and steel blue-gray eyes. He was wearing a fedora with his iron gray hair poking out from underneath. He had a big scar across his cheek to the right of his nose and another one on his neck that was poking out just beyond his shirt collar. When she looked down at his hand, it had like a half moon scarred into it as though it had been branded with fire. To Sally, he looked to be old as the hills. She was just 11 years old at the time, but in reality, the man was probably a bit above 50. Sally was absolutely petrified. She was terrified that she'd been caught and her mind started to run wild with what was going to happen to her and all the trouble that she would get in and what her mother would say when she found out what she'd been up to. And then her worst fears were realized when the man told her that he was an FBI agent and that she was under arrest. Poor Sally broke down in tears. She was absolutely hysterical. The FBI agent pointed across the way to City Hall, which was the tallest building in Camden. He said there that that is where kids like her were sent, that thieving youths were sent to the reformatory. Now, Sally didn't really know much about the reformatory, but what she did know is that it wasn't a good place to go. But then his manner perked up and he told Sally that she was lucky that it was him who had caught her and not some other FBI agent. He told her that if she agreed to report to him from time to time, he would show her mercy and let her go. Sally was completely overcome with relief. She couldn't believe how close she'd come to getting into major trouble. And she was so glad that she wasn't going to have to phone her mother from a jail cell. The man let her go and Sally sprinted all the way home, heart pounding from adrenaline and relief. But a couple of days later, as Sally was making her way home from school, the men found her and ambushed her. And this time he told her that actually the rules had changed. Now Sally had to go with him to Atlantic City under strict instruction from the government and that if she did not comply that this time she really would go to the reformatory. He instructed her to tell her mother that he was the parent of a couple of school friends and that he was taking all of them away for a seaside vacation. He said that he would take care of the rest with a phone call to Ella Horner and a convincing performance at the bus depot. So Sally dutifully complied and he phoned her house to tell Ella Horner that he was taking her away with a couple of school friends. And Ella Horner let her daughter Sally go. At the time, she was in between jobs and the family were this close to having the electricity cut off. She knew that she couldn't give her daughter any semblance of a vacation at the moment and that anything that this man could offer her would be better than the alternative. So the next day, she took them to the bus station. She waved them off and watched as Sally sat beside this tall, shadowy man on the bus. But, of course... That man was no FBI agent. In fact, he wasn't affiliated with law enforcement at all, at least not in the uh, to protect and serve sense of the word. His name was Frank LaSalle, although it's thought that that is probably one of the more than 20 aliases that he would regularly use. And just two months prior, Frank LaSalle had been released from prison for the statutory rape of five girls between the ages of 12 and 14. He'd also done time for drunkenness, bootlegging, and all sorts of petty crime throughout Philadelphia and the Midwest area. Now, little is known about Frank's first 40 years of his life, but Sarah Weinman did a phenomenal job of dragging up what she could. Frank was born in Chicago, although it's not actually known what his exact age was. He worked as a mechanic, but he would job hop a lot and he was unemployed more often than not. He had a clear preference for underage women, which is so creepy, and that was very apparent even with his first and only wife, Dorothy Dare. He met Dorothy when she hadn't quite turned 18. She was a recent high school graduate and she had curly brown hair that framed a lovely heart-shaped face. And at the time, Dorothy was kind of going through a rebel against her parents phase. She used to fight with her dad all the time because he was very, very strict on her. And she was regularly looking for ways to escape. And seems like she found that escape in the form of much, much older Frank LaSalle. 
The two ran off together and Dorothy's father was obviously quite unhappy about the situation. She was a minor and Frank, even if you shaved five years off his age, was still more than twice her age. So her father got the local police involved and they sent out an eight state teletype for the arrest of Frank LaSalle. 10 days later on July 22nd, 1937, the jig was up. Law enforcement arrested Frank LaSalle, who was at the time going by the alias Frank Fogg in Roxborough, Pennsylvania. They then picked up Dorothy uh, in a nearby town called Wissahiggin and she was staying in a room that the two had rented together. They were both taken into custody and then Frank dropped a bombshell. He said that actually the two of them had gotten married and had the certificate to prove it. That meant that the charges had to be dropped. And it seemed that for a few years they actually had a pretty happy marriage. They were living in Atlantic City and Frank seemed to be going by his regular name. In 1939, the two had their first child together. Her name was Madeline. But then the marriage began to sour a few years later when Frank was arrested on bigamy charges. Not much is known about that particular arrest, but he was later acquitted for that. Two years later, when their child was three, Dorothy sued Frank for desertion and failure to pay child support. It's thought that Dorothy had discovered her husband in a car with another woman and become so enraged that she beat the woman with her shoe. But it's also possible that Dorothy had learned the truth about her husband's disgusting perversions. On September 4th, 1942, Frank LaSalle was indicted in Camden County Criminal Court for the statutory rape of those five girls. Although he wasn't arrested until February 2nd, 1943, and he pled not guilty a week later. Just a little over a month later, on March 22nd, he changed his plea to no contest, and he received a sentence of two and a half years in the Trenton State Prison. But just 14 months later, on June 18th, 1944, Frank LaSalle was paroled. But he didn't make it very long in the outside world. He got himself a security card and he landed a job as a mechanic in Philadelphia, but he then, in October 1944, got arrested for assault. So that's great. And um, weirdly, the charges were later dropped around Halloween. And then in just September 1945, Frank LaSalle got indicted again, but this time for forging checks. But this actually got him sent back to prison. So he returned to Trenton State Prison on March 18th, 1946. So at this point, he's supposed to serve 18 months to five years on these new charges. But then he also was supposed to serve out the remainder of his sentence for the sexual assault case. So then tell me why the man was paroled in January 1948, like less than two years after going back to jail. After that, nothing is really known about his wife Dorothy and their daughter. They pretty much totally faded from the public eye after that point. So this brings us to Sally and Frank when they are on their way to Atlantic City. Frank was using the alias Frank Warner and they moved into a rooming house on Pacific Street. Sally would call her mother on several occasions from payphones and she would also write her letters. She told her she was having a great time and not to worry. So for six whole weeks, her mother thought that nothing was wrong. She thought her daughter was having a whale of a time on this vacation. So during the first week, Sally told her mother that they were going to be staying on for a little bit longer. After the second week, her excuses became a little more vague, and then by the third week, the phone calls had stopped altogether. And then Ella's letters weren't being sent. They were getting returned to her, and she hadn't actually had a letter from Sally either. So this is when alarm bells began to ring for her. And the last time she heard from Sally, she told her that her and Frank Warner were moving on to Baltimore and she thought that was really strange because that's not what they discussed or agreed on and where were the other two kids? That was when in a crashing wave of comprehension Ella Horner realized that she'd been duped and that her daughter Sally Horner had actually been kidnapped. The last time she'd received a letter from Sally was on July 31st 1948. She phoned the police later that day to report her daughter kidnapped. Law enforcement responded immediately and they turned up to Atlantic City and descended on the house where Frank and Sally were staying. But by the time they got there, it was already too late. The two of them had totally cleared out, leaving behind just a couple of suitcases of clothes. 
but during their search, police also found a picture of Sally and it was one that nobody had seen before. So it was clear that Frank had actually taken this of her during their travels. She was fair haired and sitting on a swing with a slight smile on her face, but a bit of a look of sadness in her eyes. She was just 11 years old when this picture was taken as well. Now investigators had the difficult task of breaking the news to Sally Horner. Not only had they been unable to locate her daughter, but they now knew that Sally was in the clutches of a serial sex offender who had only just six months prior finished up a prison sentence for statutory rape of five prepubescent girls. So Frank and Sally, having fled Atlantic City, wound up in Baltimore in September 1948. They kept up a father-daughter charade where they lived on, in Barclay, which was a neighborhood on the east side of the city. Sally attended St. Anne's Catholic School, which was at 2200 Greenmount Drive. And it was probably within walking distance of her new home. But they didn't stick around long. They left Baltimore and headed for Dallas in April of 1949. The timing of this move seemed to coincide with the fact that Camden County Court had just indicted LaSalle for a second time. They'd initially indicted him back in 1948 for the abduction of Sally Horner and that sentence would carry a maximum penalty of five years behind bars. But this second more serious indictment, which was issued on March 17th, 1949, carried a far heavier punishment with possible sentencing of up to 35 years in jail. LaSalle had kept up the whole FBI act for Sally and he made the excuse saying that the government needed him to investigate something in Dallas and that's why they moved. So once again, they managed to evade the Camden police. This time, Sally and Frank went by the alias of La Plante. They were living on Commerce Street in a trailer park in a kind of run down part of the city. They stayed here from April 1949 until March 1950. All the neighbors considered Sally to be a very typical 12 year old. They thought that she was just a kid living with her widowed father, although they did find it a bit strange that he kind of never ever let her out of his sight. Seems like she enjoyed taking care of her home. She would bake every once in a while. She had a dog. And Frank LaSalle would give her a lot of pocket money for clothing and sweets whenever she wanted. She'd spend her time going shopping, swimming, or even go to the neighbor's trailer for dinner or to watch TV together. Frank once again set up shop as a mechanic and Sally attended another Catholic school. This school was called Our Lady of Good Counsel and her report card from 1950 shows that she was a pretty good student and she got mostly A's and B's. Although in September of 1950, she missed 10 days of school because she was hospitalized for appendicitis. She had an operation to remove her appendix and it seemed that her mood and demeanor really changed after that. Neighbors and members of the community thought that Sally just didn't seem to act like a normal 12 year old. They thought that she seemed haunted and a bit older than she should be for her age. Like, you know, wise beyond her years, but in a bad way, like in a trauma response way. But otherwise people kind of didn't think anything was that amiss. They thought that they seemed like a pretty devoted father daughter unit and thought it was otherwise quite normal. One neighbor even said that he didn't know who was more spoiled, Sally or the dog. When these people later found out what had happened to Sally, they were completely shocked. They were surprised that she felt she couldn't confide in them and they were none the wiser about what was actually going on. So throughout all of these years, even though she was going to school and hanging out with neighbors, she never ever told anybody the truth. She thought no one would believe her. She didn't think that it was possible that they would realize she'd been abducted when Frank seems like such a loving and devoted father. But there was one woman who did think something might be wrong. Her name was Ruth Janish, and there's not a lot known about her and her husband, but we know that she was married to an itinerant farm worker, and they would move around the country wherever the work was, and if work dried up, they'd quickly leave. So at the beginning of 1950, the Janishes were living in the same West Dallas trailer park as Sally Horner and Frank LaSalle. 
Ruth suspected pretty much immediately that Frank was not actually Sally's father and her spidey senses started tingling. She definitely thought something was up. She thought it was particularly strange that Frank would not let Sally out of his sight except for her to go to school. She thought it strange that Sally didn't have any friends. She had no friends her own age. She never went anywhere. She just stayed in the same place and spent all of her time with Frank. She said that he was abnormally possessive of Sally. Ruth tried really hard to coax Sally into opening up and telling her the truth about what their relationship was actually like, but Sally wouldn't crack. So the Janishes left for California in March 1950, hoping that they would have more work there. But as they left, Ruth just couldn't let go of this sneaking suspicion that not all was well with Frank and Sally. So she began hatching up a plan. She wrote to Frank LaSalle and suggested that he and Sally follow them and come with them. And in fact, she'd even reserved a trailer park spot next to their little trailer for them to come and park up. Frank was in, he thought this was a great idea. So the two of them packed up and left Dallas for San Jose, arriving on Saturday, March 18th in 1950. Once they arrived, Frank started looking for work and for whatever reason, he thought it made more sense to catch the bus in rather than take his own car and drive. So Sally ended up being left alone at home a lot more than usual. He figured he had left her alone in the past and she was perfectly trustworthy, so this was no issue. But ever since her appendectomy, Sally had been growing increasingly restless and kind of looking for a way to escape. Also, just to add to that, now she was further away from home than she'd ever been before. This wasn't Dallas, this wasn't Baltimore or Atlantic City. Now she was in California, the West Coast, and on the complete opposite side of the country to her family and her home. And this is a really sad part. Before they left Dallas, Sally actually had opened up and confided in a school friend. She told this person the true nature of their relationship and the friend blamed Sally and told her that what she was doing was wrong and that she needed to stop, that this behavior was perverted. So can you imagine that this girl finally gets the courage to tell someone the truth and they blame her for what has happened to her? Sally, obviously, being still a child, she felt totally sick with guilt and started to blame herself. Although she did start to reject Frank LaSalle's advances. And then finally, just three days after arriving in San Jose, Ruth Janish's persistent concern paid off. They knew that Frank LaSalle was safely gone for several hours. He'd gone into the city and they felt sure that he wouldn't be back for a long time. So Ruth invited Sally over to her trailer. She started encouraging her and gently coaxing to get her to open up. And finally, Sally cracked. Sally told her that she just wanted to go home. She missed her mom and her older sister and hadn't spoken to them for such a long time. So Ruth showed Sally how to operate the telephone so she could make a long distance phone call. First, Sally tried to call her mother, but the line was dead and Sally later learned that Ella hadn't been able to keep up with the payments and that their phone line had actually been cut. So next, she tried her brother-in-law, Al Panaro, at the greenhouse where he worked with her sister. And thankfully, Al picked up the phone. Al could barely contain his excitement. He asked where she was and she said that she was with a lady friend in a trailer park in Dallas and to please send the FBI. She said, tell mother I'm safe, but I just want to come home. Al told her to stay where she was and they hung up the phone. At this point, Sally was absolutely petrified that Frank LaSalle would find out what she'd done and Ruth spent a lot of time trying to comfort Sally and reassure her that she would be safe. Fortunately, Al totally followed through on his promise. He immediately notified the FBI's office in New York, who then phoned the sheriff's office in Santa Clara County. Federal agents and sheriff's deputies sped over to the trailer park where they found Sally alone. She was totally relieved to be rescued, but absolutely terrified that Frank would come back and find out what she'd done. Police took Sally to a juvenile detention center where she underwent a medical examination. And it's very sad, and I guess it speaks to the time, but 
you know, she didn't like have a support person with her or anything and they didn't wait for her to speak to her mother or fly her mother out or anything. They just took her to this place and you know, it's not like there's any victim support counsel or anything. Meanwhile, other law enforcement officers waited at the trailer park for Frank LaSalle to return. And the second his bus rolled up and he stepped off, he was arrested. He vehemently denied all the allegations and insisted that Sally was actually his daughter and that they'd got all of this wrong. He said he was her father and had raised her since she was a little girl and that he was married to her mother. He told agents that Ella Horner, Sally's mother, has known where they have been every single day and had every opportunity to come and rescue Sally. But the next day, Frank LaSalle was charged for violating the Man Act 2, which is for transporting a female across state lines with the intention of corrupting her morals. The police required Sally to be in court to hear the charges and that's just another sad thing. You know, this young girl who has just been through a living nightmare has to so quickly go and face her abuser once again. So obviously she had a very strong emotional reaction to seeing Frank again. She screamed and cried and insisted that she'd never seen that man before in her life until the day that she went into that Woolworth store. Obviously the authorities were not buying Frank's story and they thought that this case was best handled by New Jersey. So they dropped the federal charges and arranged for him to be extradited back to New Jersey. Camden County prosecutors flew all the way to California just so they could personally escort Frank LaSalle back to New Jersey on a train. And the three of them were all handcuffed together because flights didn't allow prisoners to wear handcuffs on the plane at the time. Sally headed back to New Jersey finally on a United Airlines flight. She arrived in Philadelphia just before midnight on March 31st, 1950. It was the first time Sally had ever been on a plane and although she was really nervous, she was just so excited to see her family and her friends again and go back to her life. Her mother, Ella, waited anxiously at the airport and the plane was quite delayed and every time a plane would come in and land and it wasn't the one, she would just get more worked up and couldn't wait to see her daughter. When Sally's plane did land, they were 33 minutes delayed, but finally she arrived. Sally stood at the doorway of the plane and looked out over the crowd and there was a crowd because this had made news at that point and then she spotted her mother and the two of them just sprinted to each other and had the biggest hug. Both of them were crying and they were just lost in their own little world and there were cameras flashing all around them. All these reporters were trying to get a picture for the paper the next day but they were just so overwhelmed to be reunited. So all Sally wanted to do was go home and get into her own bed and just go back to her normal life. But prosecutors said that unfortunately that would not be possible because she had to stay in their care until the trial was over. So they took her to the Camden County Children's Center, which was a nearby Pensalkin, and she was going to be watched over and looked after for as long as necessary. When they arrived at the centre, uh, her aunt and her brother-in-law Al and her sister and her two-year-old niece were waiting for her. She cried when she saw her sister because she'd missed her so much and Sally was able to hug her little niece for the first time. She had been born just two months after Sally had been abducted so she'd never met this sweet little bundle before. During this time, Sally was carefully monitored uh, while she stayed at the center and she wasn't really allowed visits from pretty much anybody except her mother, which also seems really sad in my opinion, but you know, I guess it's a different time. And they did this because they wanted to keep her calm in a calm state of mind before, during and after the trial. But fortunately, her stay wasn't actually that long because Frank LaSalle surprised everybody by pleading guilty to all the charges. He even waived his right to counsel and said that he wanted to spare the family from any more unwanted publicity. So that's something, I guess. Sally dressed in the same new navy blue suit that she'd worn on her return home. She sat at the back of the courtroom, she didn't say a thing, she didn't have to testify fortunately, she never once looked at Frank LaSalle, and the judge sentenced him to 30 to 35 years in Trenton State Prison. 
The judge did not mince words during sentencing. He called Frank LaSalle a moral leper, which I think is a great way to describe him, and said that mothers across the country can now breathe a sigh of relief knowing that a monstrous predator like him was safely behind bars, and I wholeheartedly agree. But then the media coverage was really gross as well, and it sort of pivoted between sympathy and unfortunately victim blaming. They always commented on Sally's appearance and would call her plump and husky even though she was 110 pounds on a five foot frame which is honestly 100% normal. And why does it matter anyway? <sighs> it's actually like two hours later my camera died so uh here we are picking up where we left off just before. So not only did the press publish Sally's name everywhere, something that fortunately would never happen today as a minor, but they shared very intimate details of what Frank LaSalle had subjected Sally to. Things that honestly nobody needed to know. Even Sally's mother seemed to have drunk the Kool-Aid a little bit of the way that the press were kind of subtly, well, sometimes not so subtly, victim blaming and making Sally responsible for the trauma she had endured. And a few days after Sally was rescued, her mother was interviewed by the media and she's holding up a photo of her daughter and she says that no matter what her daughter did, she can forgive her as though it was her own fault that she had been kidnapped and held captive as a sex slave. So even though Frank LaSalle had pled guilty and waived his right to counsel, he still thought he could wiggle his way out of prison. And to be honest, I am not surprised given his track record of seemingly getting off with a slap on the wrist. Funnily enough though, a later court filing revealed that hadn't exactly gone as LaSalle had intended. Instead of getting himself off the charges or reducing his sentence, he'd actually wound up with an extra 30 days tacked on to the end of his already very long sentence. It was revealed that he had perjured himself on the stand because he kept lying and insisting that he actually was in fact Sally Horner's natural father, which we know is not true. He spun a wild story of how he lived in Philadelphia and not with his family, being Ella Horner and Sally Horner, and that he had raised her from birth and he would send money to Ella to support them. He even went so far as to judge justify his kidnapping of Sally Horner by saying that her mother didn't really care about her and she didn't really love her and she didn't buy her the things that she wanted so he was doing her a favor you know. He later claimed that he had pled guilty because of fear of mob violence and that he said that the prosecutor had told him that there was no point consulting a lawyer because it would have done him no good in the end, although these claims were unfounded. Fortunately for the good of society, Frank LaSalle never saw the outside of a prison again. He died of arteriosclerosis inside Trenton State Prison on March 16th, 1966. He was just shy of 70 at the time and 16 years into his sentence. So after Sally returned to Camden following uh, her release from Frank, the details are a little bit sparse, but it seems as though um, Sally and Ella pretty much just picked their lives up where they'd left off before Sally was abducted in 1948. Sally finished eighth grade, although she was a year behind, and she graduated with honors. Everybody recalled Sally as being very smart and a straight A student. People said that she was really looking forward to taking the next step, going to high school, looking forward to college and getting a job. And I am sure that all she wanted to do was put the last 21 months behind her and move on with her life. Sally really loved the outdoors. She loved swimming, the sun, and particularly she was fond of Jersey Shore. And she would spend a lot of time there both before and after her abduction. Her family said that she seemed happy most of the time, but that there were definitely times when she was not all there. They said she didn't get sad or depressed as such, but they definitely knew that something was wrong. And obviously being the 50s, there wasn't really any kind of trauma counseling or victim support or therapy. It was just like unthinkable at the time. People kind of thought that Sally should just get on with it and deal with it and never let this terrible trauma affect her life moving forward. 
And to make matters so much worse, the public didn't view Sally as being a child who was the victim of a terrible, terrible trauma. They viewed her as a young woman who had willingly given up her virginity to a much older man. So because of this warped and twisted narrative, she was badly bullied and harassed at school. This also meant that she didn't have any friends, which is real sad. She never saw Frank LaSalle again and she never mentioned him. In fact, the entire family kind of maintained this code of silence. Her niece, her sister's uh, first child, she didn't even know of Sally's abduction until she herself was well into her teens. Ella Horner continued to find intermittent work as a seamstress and she and Sally continued to live in the same two-story house on Linden Street. It's pretty sad that Ella never removed Sally from school where she was getting so picked on and I guess the idea of upping sticks and moving for a new image probably wasn't really an option for Ella who was already struggling so much to keep things afloat. I guess she had a lot of her own stuff going on maybe and again it was the 50s and times were different I suppose. What else is interesting is that Ella claimed that she was a widow but there's actually zero documentation to show that she had ever been married before. So that actually suggests that both her children had been born out of wedlock, which, you know, by today's standards, that's on a, like no big deal. It's really normal. But back then it was not quite so accepted, you know? She was particularly cagey about the father of her first child, Susan. And it's thought that she probably had an affair with a man who was probably married and had an existing family of his own. So Sally would spend a lot of time with her sister and um, her brother-in-law in Florence, just 20 miles away from Camden, but when she wasn't there, she would spend time working her part-time job as a waitress. And you can probably understand, Sally was very isolated. She had been pretty iced out by the locals, people didn't really know how to treat her, they thought she was... Um, this amoral girl. But then she met 15 year old Carol Starts. She was a borough classmate. The two of them became fast friends and they were inseparable. The two girls decided to get out of town for the weekend so they decided to go on a road trip and spend some time at a resort in South, South New Jersey in a place called Wildwood and this was in August of 1952. And this is where the story gets really sad and you're probably already thinking how can it get worse because this poor girl has already been through so much but this would be Sally's last fun weekend away. On Saturday August 16th Ella Horner gave her daughter permission to take the bus to Wildwood with her friend Carol. As soon as they arrived at the resort the girls decided to go out dancing and have a good time and while they were there they joined another group of people who were there. One of the people that Sally met in this group was 20 year old Edward John Baker. He lived in Vineland which was a sparsely populated town in South Jersey. Sally was instantly taken with Edward and pretty quickly developed a bit of a crush on him. He was older, he had a car, he was popular and well liked, he worked in a manufacturing plant but most importantly he was equally as taken with Sally. And Sally's still a young girl, you know, this is probably her first ever crush. She was just 15 at the time, but she and Carol had been using fake IDs, so she told Edward that she was 17. During her time in Wildwood, Ed and Sally spent a lot of time together. They went on long walks and it was just like this cute little um, kind of bubble of romance in her very sad life. So when it came time to go home, it's no surprise that Sally really wanted to stay on. She wanted to catch a ride back home with Ed in his car rather than catch the bus with Carol as planned. So Carol went home by herself. She left the resort by bus on the evening of August the 17th and she arrived in Camden by midnight that night. Sally and Ed set out as planned in the wee hours of August 18th, 1952. Just after midnight, 
somewhere along the Woodbine Dennisville Road, which is now part of Interstate 78. Ed drove his 1948 Ford sedan into a parked truck on the side of the road, and that knocked the truck into another parked truck. Ed came out of the car with minor injuries, which was quite remarkable, and he was taken to hospital and treated for those. Sally, though, died instantly. Her death certificate listed the cause of death as a fractured skull at, due to a blow on the right side of her head. She'd broken her neck and had other mortal injuries, including um, crush injuries on her chest, she had internal injuries, and she had broken her leg above the right knee. The coroner decided not to even bother with an autopsy because Sally's death was very clear. The damage to Sally's face from the accident was so severe that law enforcement felt that it would be too traumatizing for her mother, Ella, to identify her body. So instead, Al Panaro went to identify his sister-in-law. He said that the injuries to Sally's face were so severe that he couldn't recognize her. The only way he knew for certain that it was Sally was because of a distinct scar on her leg. A funeral was held in Camden and a veil covered the casket. Dozens of people showed up, including extended family, schoolmates, and members of the community. Frank LaSalle decided to make his presence known to the family as well. He sent flowers for the funeral, but the family were not interested in his flowers and they were not displayed. Police had arrested Ed and held him on charges of death by automobile, but those charges were dropped two years later when it became just very clear that this was a horrible, horrible accident. So that brings us back to this book and Sally's story is just devastating and the book doesn't end quite so horribly but it's thought that Vladimir Nabokov was struggling to complete his novel and as he was working on it he read in the newspaper an article about what happened to Sally Horner and kind of used it as inspiration and I guess the scaffolding for his finished work. And in fact he actually references Sally's experience towards the end of the novel when Humbert Humbert reflects over whether or not he had done to Dolores Hayes what Frank LaSalle had done to Sally Horner back in 1948. There have been many pop culture adaptations of the Lolita novel, starting with the 1962 Stanley Kubrick film. There have been plays, operas, other film remakes, all sorts of adaptations. We've also seen the whole Lolita aesthetic become swept up across social media platforms by millennials and Gen Z and this is really perpetuated by a lot of celebrities as well like Lana Del Rey who had a brand that was very similar to that kind of you know heart-shaped glasses, American sweetheart, um, I know that there are a few other celebrities who've released albums or songs with the name Lolita, lipsticks called Lolita, lingerie with Lolita branded on it. So you can see that that hypersexualized version of this young girl has really grown into its own monster. Academic Barbara Churchill of the University of Alberta wrote, quote, the Lolita image has so pervaded popular consciousness that even those who've never read the book usually know what it means to call a girl Lolita. The moniker Lolita, translated into the language of popular culture, means a sexy little number, a sassy ingenue, a bewitching adolescent siren. And I think we can all agree that that is very true. But I am not going to go into too much detail on the romanticization of Lolita. In fact, Jordan Teresa did an excellent video on this very topic and I will link that in the description box below. I highly, highly recommend you watch it. She goes into a deep dive on all of this pop culture narrative around it. I think the most important thing to know is that there is nothing cute or aesthetic about the Lolita story. Vladimir Nobokov stated himself that the book is not a love story and that 
sexualizing these young women was the opposite of what he set out to do. In fact, he would be turning in his grave right now if he saw how people had taken his work and completely turned it into this other thing entirely. And I think when you know how closely Sally Horner's story parallels Lolita, that makes it all the more disturbing. When you think that an actual person, a real life human, went through those horrific traumatic events, it's really gross to see how people are sexualizing this idea of this young girl and how she almost is seducing this much much older man it's so gross anyway let me know your thoughts in the comment section below did you know about this case did you know that lolita was loosely based on the real life really awful much worse story of sally horner um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, if you have any case recommendations, please drop them below. I always read the comments. If you're with me to this point, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, give it a like, um, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.